Welcome everyone to today's webinar on the future of retail. Um, before we get started, just wanted to go over a um, couple of quick housekeeping notes. Everyone is muted um, on the line, so you're not able to speak. If you have any um, questions or issues, feel free to type those into the either the chat box or the questions box, and we'll be sure to, to monitor those throughout. Um, we will do all question and answer at the end, um, but feel free to kind of type questions as you have them, and then um, again, at the conclusion of the of the webinar, we will um, go through those questions. Um, another note is that we are planning to record this, so as long as the technology all works well, um, the recording should be available um, and posted on our on our website and social media channels, um, generally within about 24 hours um, at the conclusion conclusion of the webinar. So, so with that, I want to take a moment to introduce our speaker today, Joshua Bloom. Uh, Josh is a principal at the Community Land Use and Economics Group and He's based in Philadelphia. In 2016, he co-led the National Main Street Center's refresh initiative <clears throat> to rethink the Main Street model and shift the emphasis towards market-based transformation strategies. Over the last four years, he's been helping Main Street programs make that shift by using market data to define their own economic development strategies. <clears throat> in 2019, he authored a publication for the Main Street Center called The Future of Retail, on which this webinar is based. Prior to joining the Clue Group, Josh is a senior program officer at the National Main Street Center, where he led the program's urban expansion. In Philadelphia, Josh is also the board president of Weaver's Way, a $32 million cooperatively owned business with three grocery stores, two health and beauty aid stores, a pet supply store, and a mercantile gift shop. So with that, I want to welcome Josh and turn it over to him. Hi, everybody. Um, as Steve just said, I'm, I'm here in Philadelphia and uh, Real life may intrude a little bit on uh, on us because I hear the recycling truck coming down the street, and <laughs> and usually when I'm on the phone, the uh, the dog decides to pick up a, a squeaky toy. So we'll see how that goes. Um, we are not using a webcam today, but I thought I would just at least uh, at least you could be able to see who you're talking to. Of course, this isn't working. There we go. That's me um in valentine nebraska and so we are here to talk about what um what retail is going to look like in the future and um the future is is always a surprise when it becomes the present but we're gonna um talk about some of the some of the trends that are happening and and um some of the forecasts of what we think might happen coming down the road so the, the first question to ask is what's so special about retail uh, and in historically, retail was actually uh, retail, which is the selling of things, um, historically only accounted for about 15 to 20 percent of downtown businesses. But we think of retail as being kind of central to, to the function of commercial districts and downtowns, and that's because retail creates reasons for people to make regular trips to the business district. And it's those regular um, trips that create vibrant sidewalks and vibrant storefronts um, and kind of sustain the economy of the, of the district itself. Um, because in the end, what we want, especially in trying to um, preserve main streets of all kinds, is to create those kinds of vibrant um, central places. So we're going to start uh, with talking about what's driving the change. And um, you know, the obvious thing is the internet, but there's actually other things going on in addition to the internet. Um, so a little bit about that first. And you may have all, because uh, the Main Street Center and, and I have been showing um, this chart for a long, long time. Uh, this is what you're looking, if you haven't seen it before, what you're looking at is uh, on the, uh, y-axis you're looking at a variety of services of the kinds of things that are sold in traditional business districts and on the x-axis you're looking at um, the range of price points and traditionally downtowns sold uh, virtually all of the things across the range of items you could buy across and they sold them across a range of price points what happened when malls came in was they took out that that oval um, uh, in the center there, because malls first started selling clothing and uh, and shoes and jewelry and things to keep you busy while you were doing that. 
after the malls, um, we had big box stores. And in response to big box stores, malls changed the kinds of things that they were selling. And they started, uh, um, and together, they really took out a huge chunk of where downtowns traditionally um, did their business. Leaving for downtowns, professional services, restaurants, personal services, and some chunk of the other categories, um, you know, sort of to the right on the right hand side of this, or if you could imagine, um, the malls didn't capture everything, but they captured a lot, and the big box store is the same. Then we now have the expanded malls, big box stores, and the internet, which have taken out an even larger chunk of where downtowns traditionally excelled. And so what we've got left are really a few areas where downtowns can still um, can still kind of break in, but it makes a lot of sense why many downtowns have become much more oriented toward dining and entertainment and um, less oriented toward retail. From, uh, from 2010 to 2013, mall visits fell by 50%. And that trend has continued. Uh, mall visits have dropped every year since that time. Um, and in 2019, off-mall retail, non-mall retail store sales rose 3%, while sales, a modest 3%, while sales at mall-based re retailers dropped 29%. In 2019, there were over 9,000 chain store closures. Uh, and here is a list of some of those closures. Uh, and those closures um, have impacted largely the malls and shopping centers, um, but to some extent, they've also impacted uh, downtowns. Macy's plans to close an additional 125 stores this year. And other chains have already announced 1,200 store closures, and it's only February. So some of these closures are being driven by lifestyle changes, that is, people becoming um, less, um, just less interested in going to shopping malls and shopping centers. Um, but part of it is also being driven by just the change in how people are shopping. So trade areas, which um, which physical stores depend on and factor into their uh, um, their potential sales are becoming less relevant even for convenience type purchases, um, many of which are uh, migrating online. And as a result of trade areas becoming kind of less, less relevant, um, uh, what's happened at the same time is therefore a sales gap or sales leakage has become less relevant. It no longer it's no longer uh, a, as much of a consideration of how much of local potential sales a store can capture when those sales can be made by almost anyone. As you know, uh, as you probably know, one company now captures 50% of online retail, sale, or online retail, retail sales. Um, and while it's true that um, uh, that Amazon captures the majority of, or, or half of all uh, online retail sales. More than half of those sales are sold by third-party merchants to Amazon, um, but they're all part of the same platform. And uh, Amazon sales have grown basically every quarter for the last uh, for the last 20 years and you can see that trend here online sales in general have increased every single quarter for the last 10 years and yet they still only represent about 11% of all retail sales so that's 620 billion dollars per year but those sales are projected to grow to 25% of all retail sales by 2026. So who are capturing the rest of those sales? Um, big box stores are still the competition for small stores. Um, and they, uh, 
um, and they continue to capture a lot of the kinds of um, everyday purchases that, um, that people make. At the same time, the big box stores are in competition with even larger stores. Uh, and, um, and that is the, and, and so the big box stores are both trying to get into the online market and at the same time competing with larger stores that are selling um, bulk items like Costco and BJ's and Sam's Club. For the fourth quarter of 2019, to give you an idea, Target sales were up, were barely up by 1.3%. Um, Walmart sales were slightly better, up 4.2%. But Costco outpaced both of them with sales up 9%. People don't buy, and that's because people don't buy in bulk online, um, and they tend to buy single items online, whereas Costco still offers a savings when um, when purchasing in quantities. So meanwhile, there are, there are some other things going on that aren't even that aren't as directly uh, connected to the um, uh, to the retail industry. One of them, which we've heard a lot about in um, uh, in the news and in, uh, in in the recent past, is uh, growing income inequality. And one of the results of growing income inequality means that there's less to be spent on retail. And here's why. So in 1970, middle-class families earned 65% of all income. Today, they earn about 40% of all income. When you have greater concentration of wealth, in fewer people, it results in less retail spending. And that's simply because wealthier people save a much larger share of their income and spend less on goods and services. Overall, as a society, we are spending more and more of our money on services. And services means a bunch of things, but in um, but where a lot of that money money is going is toward big ticket items, which are not necessarily services that you would buy downtown, for example. Um, and and the, and of course, stores still mostly sell things. So, for example, um, since 1980, college tuition has increased at double the rate of inflation. And in 1960. Americans spent 5% of their income on health care. In 2019, we spent 18% of our income on health care. In 1920, Americans spent a total of more than half their income on food and on clothing. Today, Americans spend about 10% of their income on food, including, uh, including food away from home, that is restaurant dining, and they spend only about 2.4% of income on clothing. Like most things that we buy, food and clothing have become cheaper over time when you adjust for inflation, but as spending, but the, um, one of the results of, one of the kind of byproducts of that is that as spending shifts more and more to services, retailers, Retailers selling things have a harder and harder time because they're competing for less and less um, spending. And so as a result, the demand for retail space um, is likely to decrease. We're certainly seeing that in shopping malls and shopping centers, um, but we may also start seeing that in downtown in a different way from how we saw it with the development of malls and big box stores um, several decades ago. So now let's take a look at who's driving that change because it affects how we respond to it. Uh, so first is millennials are driving a major retail shift. Um, and part of that shift is that millennials dine out and shop more than those in other age co cohorts, but they spend 27% less than Gen X, the next older generation. 70% of millennials shopping takes place in brick and mortar stores, which might surprise you, um, but they are, they are kind of the leading edge of, what the, of, of what's affecting downtown, um, downtown retail development or downtown retail 
um, sustainability. And the shift extends to Gen Z, which uh, follows the millennials and is the first native digital, digitally native generation. And um, this is a generation that is heading toward smaller creative centers with a higher quality of life, but lower cost of living. And this generation also is buying fewer things um, and spending more money on experiences. And this, even, this trend even goes in the other direction age-wise, which is the boomers, which are now retiring um, and retired, are, um, first of all, they have, they're done buying stuff. They have all the stuff they need. And so they are spending more money on, um, on experiences rather than things. And they are to some extent piggybackers in the sense that they want to be they they want to be where the cool millennials and gen and um, Gen Zers are, and so they will often um, kind of be a follow on of the of the um, uh, of the cohorts that lead in those um, uh, in those uh, um, <laughs> types of things. All right. So let's look ahead um, and see what what is starting to happen. What is what does the future look like, and what are, what are the trends that we already see starting to happen? Um, and I'll talk about uh, four different things. The first one I want to talk about is differentiation, and uh, differentiation is this idea of that uh, retail is shifting away from being a commodity for a commodity type of sector for downtowns and commercial districts. That is, um, if you want to buy shampoo or if you want to buy um, ketchup, uh, you are probably going to go someplace other than a traditional downtown or business district to buy it. And the places where um, uh, traditional business districts are, are excelling is in uh, selling stuff that can't be bought just anywhere. And so you have trends where uh, um, toward the handmade and toward things that are artisanal and things that can't be bought at a big box store or a shopping mall. Um, Steve mentioned that I am uh, board president of a community owned business here in Philadelphia called Weaver's Way. Um, we are we are in the commodity business in, in a sense because we sell groceries, um, but we are differentiated in that we are selling uh, in our three grocery stores, we're selling um, a large assortment of local products, we're selling a large assortment of um, organic products, uh, and a large assortment of bulk products, things that you weigh out yourself. So we are differentiating ourselves in the marketplace. Um, even as we're surrounded by traditional traditional um, supermarkets and uh, and natural grocers, um, we do 32 million dollars in business a year in our three stores, um, and we have been trying new things as well. And this is another example of how we have um, been differentiating ourselves. Uh, we had this um, uh, uh, we had this garage. We have. <laughs> <laughs> this uh, this historic garage, which was uh, something of an albatross. This is uh, this is from Google Maps from uh, 2011, um, and we weren't doing anything with it. Um, and at the same time, nobody really wanted to sell it. Um, people were sort of emotionally attached to this building, which is across the street from one of our grocery stores. Um, and three years ago, one of our employees um, suggested a pop-up store at um, uh, Christmas time. And that pop-up store, uh, which, she, uh, which she started, uh, has become one of our, has become a retail addition to our, uh, our um, collection of, uh, of stores. And so it's now open year round. Uh, and we sell, um, or to, we, we sell uh, things produced by local artisans. Uh, we sell vintage furniture, uh, and um, all of that is uh, um, has created a new market for us, where um, uh, which now is a is a 
fully functioning store of the uh, of the co-op. So um, provenance and local manufacturing also matter to in a way that in ways that they hadn't mattered in the past. Uh, if any of you have been to Leadville, Colorado, it's the uh, highest altitude city in the U.S. at 11,000 something uh, feet. And in Leadville is uh, this store, which is called Melanzana. Uh, they manufacture everything in this 19th century storefront. Um, and uh, if you go there and you purchase uh, any of their fleece, mostly fleece um, sportswear, they will uh, they'll hem it to, to the length that you need right as you wait. Um, they have a website, but they don't sell. They are they are sort of a bizarre store. They sell virtually nothing through their website, um, including their signature products like this fleece pullover. Um, I have these um, these uh, fleece pants that I love and I use to exercise in in the winter, and I have to wash them two or three times a week. And I called them to try and order uh, another pair, and they will not sell it online. You have to go to Leadville. Um, to buy it in their store. And then another aspect of differentiation is legacy businesses, which um, are differentiated because they are um, they're run by generations of families. And we should be doing more to think about how we promote them, promote them as legacy businesses, and also uh, protect them. There's um, my uh, my partner at Clue Group, Kennedy Smith, will be doing a session uh, at the Main Street Conference in Dallas uh, on how to protect legacy businesses, uh, including um, public policy tools for uh, for protecting those businesses. So that's that's a little on differentiation, and the second uh, of these four areas that I that I think is important is experience and interactivity, um, which we've heard a lot about. Um, and sometimes um, it helps to just kind of think about what exactly that is and what forms it takes in traditional business districts. So, um, so one part of experience and interactivity is uh, targeted promotions and signature events. Um, things like these, um, or uh, this is this is probably familiar to everyone, um, but has been adapted in Brattleboro, Vermont, as the running of the heifers, and uh, or or this from Somerville, Massachusetts. Uh, fluff the sandwich spread was is not manufactured in Somerville, but it was invented in Somerville. And every year they have their What the Fluff Festival, uh, which includes uh, fl uh, fluff dancing, the fluffrettes, uh, fluff baking, fluff <laughs> craft, <laughs> fluff hair hair washing. Um, it's not a clean. Uh, it's not a very clean event. Um, fluff takeoffs and other uh, other um, um, fluff infused food items, fluff art, um, and so the the what the fluff festival has become a distinctive thing to Somerville and something that uh, um, can't be replicated by anybody else. And as um, as communities think about what kinds of things are unique to um, to your community itself, um, you can start to think of what kinds of events are um, uh, that kind of experience and um, differentiator. There are public space experiences too, um, which uh, and this is uh, a this was an installation in um, in a neighborhood of London. Where if you uh, push, if you um, through an app on your smartphone, you can make they they mounted these um these uh, snow cannons on the uh, tops of buildings, and so if through your 
um, app, you could start, you could make the street snow um, and create that kind of um, interactivity that happens that, uh, that, that makes it for a vibrant street. Um, you may have seen this installation in newspapers recently. It's been traveling to several cities around the country. Uh, it's currently in West Palm Beach. Um, these glowing seesaws, uh, which um, uh, which have been um, part of a public art installation that started in New York and, and as I said, has been traveling around. So, so experience can be events, it can be in the public space, and of course it can be in the stores themselves. Um, the, more and more there are stores that are basically selling only experiences. Um, escape rooms are one example that have grown dramatically over the last several years. Uh, in 2013, there were a couple of dozen escape rooms across the country, and um, and uh, according to the um, the industry that uh, that tracks their growth, there are now about 3,000 escape rooms across the country. And it works well in historic buildings, and it's basically a group of people getting together um, to solve a puzzle uh, as a group. Other kinds of businesses that are really just selling an experience. Um, this is an example of a paint and paint and, and sip uh, uh, store store or storefront um, where people uh, create art as they sip wine. This is a business uh, that I saw a few months ago in Metuchen, New Jersey. Um, it is uh, the creation of a husband and wife um, team, and it is essentially a playroom for little kids, like kids under four years old. Uh, she has built, she and her husband built a little main street inside with uh, kind of child-sized storefronts, and kids can play diner, they can play veterinarian, they can go grocery shopping. Um, she even does special activities for kids with autism so that they can, um, so that uh, um, parents and their kids with autism can play together um, in, a, in a safer kind of environment. Um, she does birthday parties uh, and so on. And then um, this was this was something that uh, I saw for the first time this year, which is the um, American Scream or Selfie Museums, where basically you can go and take pictures of yourself in creepy situations. So. Uh, and these were these became popular around Halloween last year. If your dream was to, to have a picture of yourself in a casket, um, here's your opportunity. And then there are um, what's become known as classroom retail, which are which which are actual retailers, but have incorporated some kind of teaching into, uh, into what they sell. Um, so you have a range of businesses doing this. Um, some, of the, um, some of them have been around a long time uh, um, in, in uh, offering classes on knitting or weaving or, um, or needlepoint. Um, and, and then you have just traditional retail businesses that are incorporating experiences into the retail um, the retail store itself. So uh, this is called Town Pool. Um, it's a store in Martha's Vineyard, Massachusetts. Uh, and it just sells beachwear. It's not particularly, the, the merchandise is not particularly interesting, uh, but the entrance is particularly interesting. You uh, enter through a, let's see if I can, get this to go. You enter through a, a Cheerios library. And then once you are inside the store, there's more to experience because, oops, this is, there's a little installation in the corner where um, there's a room that was built sideways and here is yours truly standing in the room. Um, and you can take a selfie that rotates your photo um, 
and they will then send you the photo. You put in your email address, the photo gets sent to you, you can post it on social media. Um, and as a result of doing that, they now have your email address. Um, so I continue to get marketing information from them. This is, uh, this is one of the Canada Goose stores, um, which has installed a cold room in their store so that you can test out um, their gear in a cold environment. Um, but then there are things that can happen on much, much smaller and simpler scales that can be incorporated into uh, um, many kinds of businesses. So a restaurant that incorporates a, um, a bocce court or the, um, you know, the most kind of quintessential uh, service business like a barbershop, which now offers you a whiskey. The third area uh, of trends and what's happening is the movement toward local. Um, I think we once thought of it as a fad, especially um, for those of you who saw Portlandia and the, uh, the episode with ordering the local chicken off the menu. Um, local has become a real movement and it seems that it is here to stay. Uh, and, um, it is, and it has a lot of things that kind of support its, um, its importance to people, um, it, it being um, connected to local community, but also uh, connected to local economies and um, reducing um, uh, um, carbon footprints by reducing shipping and so on. So lots of communities have, uh, have done things to emphasize and kind of highlight locally, uh, local independently owned businesses. Um, we, uh, from uh, where we started once with, first came the uh, microbreweries and now um, there is, uh, there seems to be a whole uh, movement of developing micro distilleries. Uh, this one is in Mount Holly, New Jersey, in an old train station. As you can see, I've been doing a lot of work in New Jersey lately, uh, as is the next slide. Um, and the, celebrating local products, um, wherever they're from and wherever you're, uh, uh, you know, where, celebrating local products in the place where you, where, um, where you are. The fourth area that, um, that I think is impacting how retail is evolving is, um, is connection. And people come for more, when people are coming to a downtown or business district, they're coming um, as much for connection as they are coming for, um, for transaction. So one of the things that we're competing for in people's attention is, um, in a sense, we're competing both with online retail, but we're all in, we're also competing with Netflix and Amazon Prime. We have to provide a motivation for why people would want to leave their sofa and actually come downtown for whatever experience you're going to offer them. Right. So connecting with people is actually a motiv motivating factor in that. Um, last summer, uh, some neighbor friends of mine asked if I wanted to go to um, an opera that was um, that was playing at uh, Independence National Historical Park um, in downtown Philadelphia, and uh, and we went, and this is it, and um, it was nothing of what I expected. I don't really care for opera particularly, um, but I thought it would be fun to go and sit in a park and watch opera, and I was expecting to see an opera performance. But when I got there, what I found was that it was actually uh, a live from the Met performance that was being projected on these giant TV screens. And so essentially thousands of people had dragged themselves and their coolers and their dinners and their wine uh, to this park to sit and watch television together. Um, and it was great. Um, and it, to me, it was amazing that it was really the motivation of being with other people that got people to come um, uh, to an event where really they could have stayed at home and watched and watch TV. 
it's not so different from why people seek out co-working spaces, uh, which has been called working alone together. Um, and it's not too different from why people, why game rooms have become more and more popular, um, places where people play board games like Risk and chess face-to-face uh, -face instead of on their um, devices. And I think I said there were four, but there were five. The fifth area that um, that is really driving uh, trends in retail is social consciousness. And, um, and social consciousness is doing well, um, doing, doing well by doing good, which is both driving how entrepreneurs are thinking and also how consumers are behaving. Uh, and there are lots of examples like, of this in all di across all different kinds of industries. Uh, this is a, um, uh, a small chain of restaurants in the Northeast called Dig In, and uh, they make a big deal about they they um, they're, they're, what they sell are uh, vegetable salads and grain bowls, and they make a big deal that they use ugly vegetables in their um, uh, in their product, meaning um, food that could not ordinarily be sold in the supermarket because it's not pretty enough. Um, and so they are reducing food waste uh, by turning it into these, uh, these beautiful salads. Um, stores that we used to think of as, um, as selling used stuff uh, are becoming part of uh, um, uh, a part of the reason they're becoming so popular is because of their connection to um, social consciousness and the idea of reuse. So it's no longer it's no longer antiques; it's now vintage, and the same is happening across the board um, with clothing. Uh, it's vintage, not used. Green Street is a small chain in the mid-Atlantic states um, with, about, uh, with about a dozen stores uh, over three states. And, um, and as, with, uh, as with other kinds of um, uh, quote, used products, um, it is really being sold as high quality, uh, high quality reuse and recycling of, um, of of clothing in excellent condition. Some companies are even getting in the business of using that as the selling point of their product itself. So, um, so hand me down. Uh, Howie's is a company in um, uh, in Britain that uh, puts a label on the inside of their jackets where you can write your name, and the next person who owns that jacket um, can write their name. And Nordstrom just announced in January that they are adding a used clothing section to their flagship stores. So that's when you know that um, that uh, that recycling and reuse of clothing or uh, has really uh, has has really become um, mainstream. So where is retail headed next, and where are downtowns? and traditional business districts had it. One area is in the development of housing, which has been on an uptick in many, many traditional downtowns because people are recognizing that it's not just more convenient, it's more fun and more interesting to live downtown. So providing lots of housing downtown is, is, um, is part of what the future of retail looks like. The future of retail also includes multiple distribution channels. So people buying online and picking up in store, um, uh, people buying in store and having it delivered, uh, stores selling through other stores or wholesaling to other retailers, uh, small manufacturers doing that. Um, those are, are all part of what the future of retail looks like. Mobile retail, uh, this is Yarnover, which is based in Southern California. Uh, and travels around to different communities on different days. Um, and it is, uh, it is a way for a store to essentially expand its trade area to become, to become super regional so that it is no longer dependent 
on people coming in the door um, uh, when it's in a single location in the downtown. Uh, another example of a mobile retail truck uh, actually here in Philadelphia. And the experience includes, the, uh, um, the future of retail includes different ways of activating retail and, and creating new and changing formats of retail. This is a night market um, in the uh, North Limestone neighborhood of um, Lexington, Kentucky. And the idea is that it's, um, the, the night, this night market includes lots of local vendors, um, but it's also a way of creating change and, and, and activating the streets. And change is part of what motivates people to come to the district to see something new and to participate in a, in a new experience. We are already starting to see smaller and smaller retail formats, which means that um, for it, it uh, um, for downtown buildings, this is going to have an impact on how we think about um, uh, um, leasable area and the kinds of the sizes of storefronts that um, businesses are going to use. So more and more um, retail will essentially become a showroom with less and less inventory. Uh, and purchases will be delivered immediately or the next day. Um, Jeff Bezos said uh, last year, I cannot imagine a future in which people will want things delivered more slowly. And one of the functions of that, of that change is that, is that businesses, that retail businesses will become more showroom oriented. Big box stores are starting to become small box stores um, in many downtowns, and they are uh, they are also dependent on um, for for some of the things they sell on quick delivery of in store or online purchases. The technology that's driving giant businesses, and you've probably seen Amazon Go, which has been setting up stores in I think a dozen cities already so far. Uh, where you uh, you walk in and walk out, you walk in, you take what you you pick what you want off the grocery shelves, and you just walk out. There are no cashiers. Everything is um, is uh, electronically tagged, and you are automatically charged. But even small stores are using technology in similar kinds of ways, if not in if not quite as sophisticated as Amazon Go. Um, so this is Farmhouse Market in New Prague, uh, Minnesota. Uh, where you become uh, a member of the um, uh, of the grocery store, you get uh, an entry card, you can shop anytime, and you check yourself out um, on our on system. Non-retail businesses are going to are are going to outpace retail businesses in downtowns, uh, and. On, and um, some of those service businesses will be experienced businesses like Airbnb and the setting up of um, lodging in downtown buildings. So this is Fredericksburg, Texas. Above these two retail stores um, are small lodging units. And there will always be a uh, certain kinds of retailers sure to stick around. Um, uh, at, um, especially as we move toward buying fewer and fewer uh, new things, there will always be repair businesses um, for the old kinds of repairs and also for uh, the new kinds of repairs. And with that, um, I think we're gonna open it up, Steve, to questions, comments, questions, discussion, thoughts yes absolutely thank you josh um so yeah if anyone has questions feel free to um type them into the to the questions tab there and we can uh answer those we have about 15 minutes left so time for for plenty of questions um i know josh earlier you got a shout out for valentine nebraska so i don't know if someone on here is from there but they <laughs> have there's also um there is the piece, this is, you know, as I said at the beginning, this is based on a piece that um, was published by the Main Street Center um, that I wrote last year. 
and that is available on the Main Street Center's website that you can distribute to your to your board, uh, your committees, et cetera. Yes, absolutely. Um, to get what's one piece of advice you would tell a traditional retailer today? A piece of advice to give a traditional retailer is to think about what I, um, I think that the, the, one of the examples I loved is just how, a, how um, something like a barbershop can turn itself into experience an experience by offering a whiskey or a cigar, whether either of those things is your thing or not. The idea that it's available, I mean, I go to the barber in the morning, so I'm not likely to, to take advantage of a whiskey. Um, but the idea that I could have one turns it into, turns it into um, uh, an experience that it would not otherwise be, right? Um, the idea of, for businesses that are doing something, like making something or repairing something, to bring those things into the front of the store so that they're visible. Um, uh, it depends on the business, on how it incorporates those things. I think we could all, we, we could probably brainstorm um, tons of examples of uh, cooking demonstrations or uh, um, uh, other kinds of demonstrations of, of how products are used that turn businesses into um, experiences. Good, uh, quite a few questions coming in. How do you determine what might be a good mix of businesses in a downtown district starting to move Forward. Start a mix. How do you determine the mix of businesses? Yeah, so how, how do you, sorry, I thought there might be more there, but how, how do you determine what might be a good mix of businesses in the downtown district starting to move forward? So I guess. Okay, so um, I think actually this connects to this idea of transformation strategies that we've been that we've been talking a lot about over the last few years. Um, this idea that um, I'm going to stop the dog from sharing. Um, <laughs> life intervenes. Um, so, so there's no ideal mix of businesses, and I think if there were, um, we would all be looking for that list of kind of what are the, you know, what's the perfect business mix for a commercial district. Rather. Um, the best way to start, I think, is to look at the assets that you have. So where where are there areas where um, the commercial district does have strengths, whether they're retail businesses, service businesses? Um, uh, um, is there a sector where they um, where you kind of have a foothold? And then you think about who the markets for those businesses are. Is it local? Is it visitors? Is it downtown workers? Um, and and then you think about what the gaps are in that mix. Um, that need to be filled in. Um, so it's not that there's a uh, it's not that there's a magic answer to what the mix should be. It's how do you create a mix that is differentiated from other places and um, uh, and that is strong in the way that it serves the the the, um, the customer groups who are kind of the best um, market opportunity. Great. Thank you, Josh. Um, I'll piggyback. This one's somewhat similar, so I don't know if you have anything else to add. Otherwise, we can kind of pass over it. But good suggestions of business mix for small rural communities with a population under 5,000. Anything you would add there? Yeah, I would. Again, um, I think it depends. But I'll say that in small communities, there is there is still an opportunity for um, more commodity type retail than in um, uh, than in other places. That is in communities which are fairly isolated. In, in truly rural communities, there is there is still an opportunity for um, for some mix of uh, everyday um, types of retail items that people would otherwise have to travel a, a large distance to uh, to find. In suburban communities and urban communities, less so because big box stores, shopping centers, malls, and so on are, are generally closer by. Thanks, Josh. Um, what do you foresee for the future of outlet slash value retail, such as name brand outlets, designer clothing, accessories? Yeah, that's a good one. I don't know. I mean, um, you're starting to see more and more of that migrating online. Um, and so the 
the question is whether that I assume the question is whether that will be an important um, kind of opportunity for downtowns and it's hard to imagine that 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 in most places that that would be um, that that would be a strong opportunity just because of the nature of the um, the kind of need for a, for a large amount of traffic and um, uh, uh, and the 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 kind of um, the need for there to be a bunch of um, uh, a bunch of off price retailers in order to attract the kind of um, the kind of volume that would make it work. So my guess is it would not be a very strong opportunity for traditional business districts. Great. Um, do you have any tips for recruiting these new forms of, of retail? Well, I think the main tip is not to think about it as recruitment, but to think about it as growing in place. Um, and uh, so I guess I, I, I would offer two things on this. One is um, the example that the chains provide is that they are really fair weather friends, right? Um, the chains are closing are, are closing stores by droves. So if if your plan is to recruit chain businesses, um, I would I would change your plan. <laughs> um, the uh, um, and the growing in place um, concept, which is all which um, has been called economic gardening, among other things. Is the idea of creating businesses where you are from uh, um, you often as spin-offs of existing businesses. So um, the example I gave of, uh, of Weaver's Way starting our mercantile business is a great example of that. And there are many, many that I'm sure you could point to in your own communities. But it is um, it is really those homegrown businesses that are the that are the place where most most new businesses and business districts are going to begin. Great. Um, and we can and then we can talk about like how you do that, like with you know business competitions, Shark Tank competitions, uh, uh, um, financial incentives, uh, public policy incentives, and so on, which could be the subject of probably other webinars. Yes. <laughs> uh, good. Another question similar to the business mix you mentioned historically downtowns were 15 to 20 percent retail. What's a healthy percentage today? Uh -huh. <laughs> That's good. Um, so the percentage has remained relatively um, relatively stable over time, but it's but I think the trend is that there is going to be less retail, and that it may be, you know, in the future it may very well be less than less than ten percent of businesses that actually sell things that you can put in a bag. Um, and so that I think that gets to the very nature of kind of how we think about the adaptation of downtown buildings to new kinds of uses. Um, you know, you had, if you, if you think about the whole past of downtowns, you had small storefronts that, that used to be car dealerships. And then they became, you know, um, uh, then they became a grocery store and then they became a restaurant. And um, so it, it's, it for our purpose, we're thinking about how do you keep the center of a community vibrant and finding viable economic uses for downtown buildings. And that trend is pretty clearly moving toward um, uh, experiences as we talked about in all of its forms, um, um, kind of threaded by or incorporating all of those other kind of virtues. So things that are differentiated, things that create ways for people to connect, things that create experiences uh, and things that that help people feel good about how they're spending their money, that they're doing it in a, in a socially conscious um, and ethical way. Um, those are the things that I think are going to drive the reuse of, of downtown buildings. And it's not and, and that there won't be a magic mix of how many of those will be retailers, um, but those retailers that exist will be different in form than many of the of the way or than the ways we've thought about retail in the past. Good. That's a good segue into our, our next question. How should we be working with property owners to reconfigure spaces for emerging retail business trends 
and or realign commercial profit expectations. Yeah, I missed the middle part. How should we work with property owners to? To reconfigure spaces for emerging uh, retail or business trends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I, um, that's that's a great question, dependent on the cooperative, on the on the cooperation of, of property owners. But I think it is going to create a reset of a certain kind, right? It's going to be um, thinking about larger spaces and how do you subdivide them. We're thinking about um, larger spaces and uh, and having uh, smaller pop-up businesses sharing those spaces, or having or cutting those cutting the backs off those spaces to be used for another purpose and just having smaller showroom type uh, um, uh, front. Um, those are all ways in which I think uh, uh, the use of downtown retail spaces is going to change. One of the things. Um, so we just, Kennedy and I just started working uh, for a second time in Ventura, California, which is about an hour north of uh, Los Angeles, beautiful historic downtown. Just north of Ventura is um, Santa Barbara. Santa Barbara, which uh, had a very high end and very thriving Main Street, um, was filled with high end chain stores and virtually all of them have closed. So Santa Barbara is now suffering as all of those, as all of those businesses have just shut their doors, having really little to do with Santa Barbara and more to do with what's happening in in um, uh, the retail sector more broadly. And now downtown Ventura has become the cool place. So in Santa Barbara, it's going to be a resetting of expectations of what that property is worth. And that I'm I'm not sure that a, that a Main Street manager will be able to convince a property owner that his or her building is no longer worth what they were renting it for to, you know, Banana Republic or Tiffany's or something, but um, but that those, uh, uh, but the market is going to reset some of those prices where um, national retailers are no longer competing for that same space. Good. Um, the last one we have isn't really a question, but just someone asking for you to do a session on the business competition, Shark Tank, public policy, financial incentives you discussed. So it sounds like you got another session okay. to submit for next year, Josh. <laughs> okay. Uh, good. That Thanks takes us to the end. We we have another. Yeah, no, thank you, everyone. Um, Josh, do you want to go? I know we had a few slides conference related. If you can skip to, yes. Yes. Skip to those. Cool. Oh, um, here's uh, if you want to reach me, that's how to reach me. And um, there you go. Good. Thank you. Um, so there's a couple deeper dive um, about you know economic vitality here. So there's an upcoming course on the advanced principles of economic vitality taking place um, three Tuesdays throughout March. So we'd encourage you, you know, if you want to learn more about some of that, Hillary Greenberg um, will be will be leading those. Um, and there's also a few sessions taking place um, at the conference that will kind of dive a little bit deeper, a um, little bit deeper into this. I believe, Josh, you're also presenting on this topic. So, um, you know, if folks want to hear it again or maybe catch a few new things, they can certainly uh, join you for that in Dallas. So, good. Well, thank you, Josh, for um, for hosting this with, with us today. Thanks for everyone for joining us. And um, again, the recording should be live about 24 hours afterwards, so feel free to go back and rewatch that if there were things you missed. So. Thanks, everybody. Right. Thank you, guys.